Welcome to the first substantive panel of the morning. Um, what I'd like to do is introduce both of our speakers first and we will run their papers together and have all of the questions at the end. And I'll ask uh, the speakers to stick to time and the questioners uh, to keep your questions succinct. So um, today we're going to hear from Richard, Professor Richard Drayton. He is a Guyana-born historian and Rhodes Professor of Imperial History at King's College London. He left the Caribbean as a Barbados scholar to Harvard University, going on then to Yale. He was at Cambridge uh, as university lecturer in imperial and extra-European history since 1500. He wasn't there since 1500. He was lecturing in history since 1500. And as fellow and director of studies in history at Corpus Christi College. And in 2002, he was awarded the Philip Leverhulme Prize for history. Um, he's also uh, Senior Research Associate of the Centre for World Environmental History of the University of Sussex. He was a member of the Academic Advisory Committee on the Bicentenary of the Abolition of the Slave Trade with the British Empire and Commonwealth Museum. Uh, he edits the Cambridge Imperial and Postcolonial Studies series of Palgrave Macmillan and is also a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History. Professor Hamid Ghani uh, served as the immediate past Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, uh, from the period 2004 to 2012. Prior to this, he served as Acting Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Head of Department of Behavioral Sciences at UE St. Augustine. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from UE St. Augustine. He also holds a Master of Arts degree in Political Science from Fordham University and PhD in Constitutional Law and Government from the LSE. He served as a member of the Constitution Review Commission in Trinidad and Tobago, as a member of the Trinidad, uh, I beg your pardon, of the Tobago House of Assembly technical team for constitutional discussions with the central government of Trinidad and Tobago, and as a member of the Round Table on Constitution Reform in Trinidad and Tobago. He's currently a member of the Constitution Commission, also in Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome, um, I'll ask our first speaker to take to the floor. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, and thank you very much uh, to the staff of Salises for organizing this wonderful conference. Uh, I want to descend just very slightly from um, Brian Meeks's tribute to Norman Gervin. He ended with the phrase, rest in peace. Well, I would prefer that Norman Gervin's turbulent and loving spirit be alive and in this room. I think that uh, uh, Norman's uh, intellect, uh, his vision uh, of and for the Caribbean is something which I think we would like to have uh, living with us. Uh, um, I am part of what you can call the independence generation, like my friend Alisa at the back of the room, uh, that is to say that we were born and were formed as individuals uh, in the midst of the political optimism, the enormous hubristic political optimism of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, the sense that, which people had, that through politics uh, in the space of one generation, one could somehow uh, re-engineer Caribbean societies and transform almost at a stroke uh, social and economic and political uh, injustice. But it's also true that our independence generation have lived as adults uh, uh, as with the spectacle uh, of repeated defeats, losses, tragedies, and compromise uh, as some of the horizons of possibility which existed for those who were making politics in the 1960s and 1970s uh, appeared very radically to be shortened. So that today we don't talk about what kind of society we want, we talk about reducing the debt to GDP ratio. <laughs> well, 67 years ago, Thursday, September the 11th, 1947, in Montego Bay in this island, a conference gathered to discuss the future of the British colonies in the Caribbean. The Closer Union British West Indies Conference marked the beginning of the road which led to the Federation of the British West Indies. It is remembered in Caribbean history textbooks as a station on the pilgrimage towards political independence. An inspection of the proceedings, however, reveals that at the time it was understood by the majority of those there 
as concerned really with renegotiating the constitutional forms of the British Empire. It was presided over by the Secretary of the State for the Colonies. Uh, quite extraordinary, in fact, to have a kind of British colonial secretary coming to meet face to face with colonial politicians. Uh, I can't think of many other examples of that. Um, and governors, but however, he was there and colonial governors dominated its proceedings. The demands of the West Indian delegates were quite limited and were phrased in language quite strange to our ears today, typified by the intervention of Albert Gomes of Trinidad. What we desire, he said, is a self-governing dominion. We in the West Indies want to graduate to self-government in the same way as Canada and Australia and all the others have graduated. We want to do it as part of the British Empire, sharing with you the traditions and qualities which have made her the greatest power in the earth and the most civilized nation in the whole universe. <laughs> the limits of this horizon, that West Indian democracy would be perpetually contained in the political architecture of the British Empire, scarcely troubled the delegates. The only troublesome character was Alexander Bustamante, whose experience of British detention at Up Park Camp during the Second World War, just a few years before, had perhaps given uh, had perhaps given him a certain clarity about the realities of power. We are just slaves of Great Britain, Bustamante told an astounded room, although she is the best of a bad bunch. And he demanded that rather than federation and some distant horizon, right now, Britain should immediately give elected members control of the Executive Council and should abolish the Legislative Council and indeed allow Jamaicans to elect their own governors. His target was the enormous powers vested in the crown in every colony, but particularly in Jamaica. And yet, in a striking and in some ways revelatory declaration of what he aimed for, Bustamante told the meeting, I want to become governor of my colony. <laughs> it might be said that almost every post-colonial prime minister of the Caribbean has aimed for nothing less. They have all aimed to be the elected governors of their post colonies, inheriting the state and constitutional machines through which a foreign minority ruled without the consent and participation of the governed. The absolute power of the crown, veiled behind the ritual of elections, provides, even in republics like Guyana and Trinidad, the essential continuity between the colonial British West Indies and the post colonial Caribbean. Just a few years after Montego Bay, in October 1953, Governor Savage availed himself of the reserve powers vested in the Crown to suspend the new constitution of British Guyana and to remove from power the People's Progressive Party government, the first elected under, under universal suffrage in that colony. Grant the Adams of Barbados and Norman Manley of Jamaica both lent their support to the British overthrow of Guyanese democracy, uh, just as, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Phillips in the, this morning said, you know, what a tragedy it was that the political parties had, that there was no alternative to the political parties as centers of political imagination in our societies. We must remember that people like Adams and Manley uh, worked together and uh, separately uh, to destroy uh, any possibility within the trade unions of there being independent centers of political activity. And they worked together to destroy the Caribbean Labour Congress which represented the alternative source of energy and momentum towards a West Indies Federation. They are complicit too in accepting the disastrous constitution of the first federation of the West Indies, which lacked a sufficiently strong central government, while locating elected administrations, both at the center and in each island, in a network of crown control. And of course, I can offer three convergent consequences in the island of Grenada. In 1962, in a move against Eric Gehry, Westminster exercised its crown powers, suspended the constitution of Grenada, and administered the, the island by the fiat of the administrator. There is a later irony that the People's Revolutionary Government of Grenada, which deposed Gehry in 1979, since it never made Grenada a republic, exercised its powers in a strict constitutional sense as a delegation of the sovereignty of Her Majesty Elizabeth II, Queen of Grenada. This logic later would, would be the means by which Paul Schoon might claim to legitimately invite uh, American intervention in 1983. The crown is not an innocent thing. 
It contains within it a naked absolutist claim of unbridled power and of the prerogative of violence. The massacre in Tivoli Gardens in 2010 is only the most recent example of the arbitrary right claimed by the Crown in the Caribbean as elsewhere to kill its own citizens without any legal process and yet still within the law. The Westminster model is traditionally understood as part of a modern machinery of representative democracy, an elected legislature with a second house to review the decisions of the first, giving a mandate to an executive and expressing in its members both the territorial space of the nation and the will of the people. But the Westminster model in its early modern as well as contemporary forms was also a machine of despotism and oligarchy. At its center was an actual or theoretical sovereign with the royal prerogatives translated into the powers of the executive and party in power, uh, even in republics where there was no formal crown. The principle of representation also involves a separation uh, of, the representi of the represented from political agency, resting uh, the, rep the political agency in a small elite and the clubs or bureaucracies called political parties, both of which are vulnerable to capture by wealth and powerful minority interests. The Westminster system thus entrenches a powerful anti-democratic core in contemporary politics and not just in the Caribbean. Let us examine the origins of this machine uh, which we still live in the midst of. What we call the Westminster system emerged out of two convergent historical events in 17th and 18th century England. First, the strengthening of the powers of central government in parallel with the absolutist monarchies of Spain and France. And second, the ascendancy of the landowning classes who after 1688, through the instrument of parliament, captured the power of the crown. It is a system which seeks to coordinate the rule of property uh, in a tight relationship with the rule of the crown. And that is the system which still prevails uh, in this region. This regime was still coming into form in England itself when it planted itself in the Caribbean and the rest of the Americas. In the House of Assembly in Bermuda, the Virginia House of Burgesses, the House of Assembly in Barbados, the three oldest Westminster parliaments in the region, uh, on the model of which legislatures were established, uh, occupied exclusively by planters uh, in Antigua, Jamaica, and elsewhere. So there was a kind of democratic origin to Caribbean societies, uh, so long as we remember that these democracies were founded on social death uh, and that slaves were non-people uh, who were not considered to be part of that democratic community. So it was a democratic form of despotism. It was the rule of property, uh, exercising local dominion in interaction with the imperial right of the British Crown and its parliament at Westminster. Uh, the dominance of London over these colonies was given a formal legal statement in the 18th century, in the Declaratory Act of 1766, which essentially said that Westminster had absolute right to legislate for these colonies, uh, with, with or without the consent uh, of uh, local legislatures, which was strengthened by the Colonial Laws Validity Act of 1865, which empowered Westminster, uh, in, in a sense, to suspend or dispense with any legislation made in the colony. Now, it's worth remembering that this law, which essentially made any law made in the Caribbean subject to the say-so of Westminster, uh, was not repealed until 1964 in Britain. And in fact, it was under its powers, the West India Act of 1962, which is a British act, uh, passed in Westminster, uh, that the political independence of the Caribbean became possible. It was through the crown and often with the patronage of colonial governors, and not against the crown, that West Indian nations acquired sovereignty. That, I think, is something which we always need to remember. Uh, that, you know, we talk about the independence struggle. Well, there was an independence struggle, but by and large, a lot of independence and a lot of the movement towards political sovereignty came through careful negotiation on the, parts of, on the part of British governors uh, with local elites. Uh, with, a, with a specific intention of controlling what the post-colonial futures of these societies would be. And we might say that they were extraordinarily successful in their negotiations. We can add to this story the, the institution of the crown colony, which emerges in the, the 18th century uh, as a child of the Enlightenment. The crown colony represented uh, the clearest expression of what in Europe we would call enlightened despotism. Uh, and which uh, vested essentially in the governor and in the executive extraordinary powers for regulating social and economic life. And this is the model which was gradually uh, expanded throughout the West Indies. Trinidad was from ab initio virtually a crown colony. Uh, Jamaica became a crown colony uh, after the crushing of the Morant Bay Rebellion in 1865. Uh, and the most extraordinary case was that of British Guyana, uh, which had representative institutions 
uh, from the Dutch period of its settlement, but in 1928 became a crown colony. Uh, and it's very interesting to remember the language that was used in the Wilson-Snell report to justify this. Uh, they said that one of the reasons why we need to make this place a crown colony is to, and I quote, prevent the loss to public life of the small but important European class which still controls the principal agricultural and commercial activities in this colony. Uh, which is to say, uh, this particular social group will not win a place in government through democratic elections, so we have to change the rules, the games, the rules of the game, in order to make sure that they can be represented in Parliament. In any event, just to kind of give a sense of what, what the British West Indies were like in this particular pattern, uh, in the era after the Second World War, the British West Indies had two classes of colonies and, and protectorates. There was, first of all, the privileged group uh, of the white dominions that had full self-government. Uh, and then there was the rest, um, in which the West Indies were, was at the head of a procession uh, of which colonies like Uganda, which had no legislatures at all, uh, were at the tail. So right at the top of the ladder uh, was Barbados, the Bahamas, and Bermuda. These had elected houses of assembly uh, with nominated legislative councils. One step down, British Guiana and Cyprus, partially elected legislative councils and no official majority. One step down from there, uh, Jamaica and the Leewards, partially elected legislative council with an official majority, that's say appointed by the governor. St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Grenada, legislative council nominated by the crown. Uh, and in all except Barbados, Bahamas, and, and, uh, and Bermuda, the crown actually had the power of legislating by order and council. So in other words, whatever the governor chose to be a law would be the law. Uh, that was the nature of that particular constitutional arrangement. So that I think that you know, we need to ask ourselves when people say, well, you know, what, um, why is it that democracy has such trouble taking root in post and former colonies uh, of the British Empire? Or why are the forms of democracy so imperfect? We must remember these... These were never democracies. These were despotisms. These were despotisms governed by and for minority interests. And to the extent that we've managed uh, even to achieve what we have achieved, it has been against this particular hurdle. Uh, and we must have a sense uh, of not history as something which is done overnight, as the generation of 1960 perhaps thought, uh, but as something which may in fact take much longer. So, four minutes more? Well, I'm going to kind of cut right down. Um, well, where are we now and where are we going? I'm going to essentially come right to the very end here. What are the Caribbean legacies of Westminster and democracy? Relatively peaceful political life. I think um, the, the positive case was given very strongly by the Honorable Minister uh, in his presentation this morning. Um, but of course, with communal vi violence in Guyana, revolutions and coups in Trinidad, decades of political violence in Jamaica, uh, high levels of structural unemployment, high levels of violence, high murder rates. Um, electoral dictatorships uh, in which we have a very weak sense of state ownership and citizenship. The kind of environmental degradation you see across the Caribbean has to do with people really not feeling that the land belongs to them to take care of. Uh, the corruption is not just a question of people you know, being uh, captured by criminals, but also of people, in a sense, not having a sense of duty and obligation to the public interest. So we have very kind of weak sense, a weak sense of state ownership, ownership and citizenship, uh, which leads to the corruption of both electors and elected. Uh, tribalism and clientelism, uh, racial states, uh, in, particularly in Guyana and Trinidad, uh, corporate power, uh, and a kind of... Uh, a, a very mixed pattern in terms of civic uh, and human rights. Um, and we might see that in some ways these are expressions and new forms uh, of the consequences of the absolutist and oligarchical features of the Westminster model uh, and the very incomplete steps we've taken towards real democracy. Well, what possibilities exist for animating popular sovereignty from below? Back in the late 1950s, uh, CLR James, uh, at the opening of the West Indies Federation, said that what we really need to have is a constituent assembly. We need to start from scratch. We need to actually create a constituent assembly across the West Indies, which can attempt to collect popular opinion as to what sort of government uh, we would like to live in, what sort of institutions we would like to have operating through uh, and around us. There was, of course, no such uh, constituent assembly, uh, neither in the parishes of the nation uh, nor in the nation itself. 
There were attempts in Jamaica in 1977 with the People's Budget to consult uh, popular opinion, uh, with which uh, Norman Girvin, of course, was very much uh, involved. Uh, and there were attempts in Grenada uh, to construct uh, forms of political life and of, uh, and of consultation, which uh, happened outside of the boundaries of parliament. Uh, but by and large, these uh, have had, had only a partial life uh, and were experiments which were very quickly uh, aborted. The question really is, will the political monopolies in any territory of the region open space for assemblies and for the whole idea of there being alternatives to political life other than parliament, uh, which might indeed make parliament a more healthy place uh, by bringing uh, into public life uh, the consent of the governed? Do we need some equivalent of the politics of Occupy? What we're certainly living in now is the crisis of the Caribbean version of the welfare state. Uh, governments simply are retreating from where they're e able, able to support at all some of the more expansive commitments which they had in the first generations of independence uh, towards uh, education and public health, particularly so in one of the countries for which I hold a passport, Barbados, which is in the midst of quite a serious uh, social uh, and economic and indeed cultural crisis at the moment surrounding this degeneration of the local version of the welfare state. How can we generate a new politics from below which can provide the means for a new kind of voluntary uh, current of political life uh, which can lead to all the other good things which we want in social and economic life? And I suggest we might take a very long view that our societies, like many societies around the world, were founded on an idea of natural subordination, of dependence and of inequality, and not on participation and inclusion. And that we should, in fact, recognize that uh, significant historical changes rarely happen in the space of 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. They may take centuries. Uh, and Pache, uh, Mr. Phillips's presentation, the first decades of English parliamentary democracy were filled with revolutions, coups, the beheading of people, uh, the jailing of, of political opponents. Um, if you look at Britain between 1640 and 1763, um, it's a pretty turbulent place. Uh, compared to that, the West Indies has been an island of stability. Um, so I think that uh, we may take a longer view and we may even be willing to risk some turbulence, which has proven in many places to be uh, part of the price uh, of future stability. At the end of party politics in the West Indies of 1962, CLR James shone an ominous light on the then opening era of constitutional decolonization. Dressed up in a lion's skin, independence clothes, our political publicists are quite unashamed and brazen. The king is dead, long live the king. Colonialism is dead, long live colonialism. Fifty years later, I find that we might still conclude with him, gird your loins to make of independence a reality, that truly West Indian reality, which is still so far from us. Thank you. We pass now to Hamid Ghani. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Madam Chair, and good morning to everyone. Uh, my presentation is one that is uh, dealing with the issue of the uh, <clears throat> constitutional foundations of societies uh, in the Commonwealth Caribbean region uh, and looking at the, the parts of the reasons why uh, the Westminster model uh, persists uh, to the extent that it does and part of that is linked to the essence uh, of the society steeped in British traditions. So that um, I want to start with a quotation from Eric Williams which tells um, the story in essence at the outset. Uh, and I'm letting you know that I have two very short videos built into this which will be within my speaking time uh, because I think that the visual impact of what I'm going to show you will, will more or less uh, dovetail very nicely. But this is Eric Williams in 1955 uh, speaking at a public meeting in Woodford Square in Port of Spain um, before he had entered electoral politics. Um, and essentially this captures the point at the outset. 
Eric Williams's view is the colonial office does not need to examine its secondhand colonial constitutions. It has a constitution at hand which it can apply immediately to Trinidad and Tobago. That is the British constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, I suggest to you that the time has come when the British constitution suitably modified can be applied to Trinidad and Tobago. After all, if the British constitution is good enough for Great Britain, it should be good enough for Trinidad and Tobago. That is the essence of which uh, that, that lies at the bottom of this whole question of um, the Westminster model in the Caribbean. This is the Westminster model rooted in the thinking of one of the leading uh, political philosophers in the region, a man who has written uh, extensively and has talked extensively about the region, the, the region, and this is his view. This is his narrative, and we have to understand the extent to which uh, a lot of what will flow from it um, comes from flow throughout the region comes from this. But there is a competing narrative, and one that I also want to put on the table, which comes from Norman Manley, uh, 24th of January, 1962, in the Jamaican House of Representatives. He says, let us not make the mistake of describing as colonial institutions which are part and parcel of the heritage of this country. If we have any confidence in our own individuality and our own personality, we would absorb these things and incorporate them into our being and turn them to our own use as part of a heritage we are not ashamed of. And Manley makes the point very, very forcefully that everything that has evolved to the point where they're on the verge of independence in 1962 is part of a quintessentially Jamaican heritage. Now, we have a debate going on here because you have Williams talking about uh, a suitably modified version of the British Constitution being imported. And you have Norman Manley saying that everything that we have as we approach independence, it belongs to us. It's part of a heritage of which we should not be ashamed. And therefore, we need to, uh, to, to essentially come to terms with this reality. Now, I want to look at, um, I've, I've, I know it, it, it looks a bit fine, and I tried to, to squeeze it in as much as I could, but it's a folio, a declassified um, file, a colonial office file, uh, CO 1031 3226. Uh, I just happen to spend a lot of time in the public record office or the National Archives at Kew Gardens uh, going through all these arcane documents and spending time with dusty old files, but I do enjoy doing that because I find things like these. Um, and, and I also read the folio entries and not just what's in the file. This is the folio entry dated the 2nd of March, 1962. Now, J.A. Peck was an assistant legal advisor in the colonial office at the time, and he's right, and, and this is something... Uh, where there's, there's an exchange going on between himself and J.E. Whiteleg of the, the West Indian Department. So it's, it's a note here. Mr. Peck, Mr. Ellis Clark telephoned me. Now, Ellis Clark was constitutional advisor to the government of Trinidad and Tobago in 1962. Uh, essentially, he's regarded as the architect of the independence constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. So at the time, he had not yet been knighted, so it, his title, Mr. Ellis Clark telephoned me that the sources of the draft Trinidad constitution are as follows. Citizenship, Sierra Leone, with the proviso for, to Article 1.1 omitted and an entirely new Article 2.1. Human rights, Sierra Leone, except the property article. Governor General, Sierra Leone. Parliament, present Trinidad provisions modified. Judicature, new form. Appeals to Her Majesty in Council, new form. Judicial and Legal Service Commission, based on Sierra Leone. Finance, common form provisions with modifications. Public Service Commission, new form. Police Service Commission, largely new form, but Nigeria provided the basis. Pension and miscellaneous provisions, common form modified. Now, at the time when this was written, Ellis Clark was on a visit to London in his capacity as constitutional advisor to the cabinet of Trinidad and Tobago. The draft constitution for public comment, which he had just put out, uh, had been published in Trinidad and Tobago on the 19th of February, 1962. Uh, so what we get here are the sources that Ellis Clark used in drafting the constitution. Now, the only originality in the document appears to have arisen in the sections on the judicature, appeals to Her Majesty in Council, and the Public Service Commission. Everything else was borrowed from other parts of the Commonwealth. Now, I, a lot of my research and writing is on the concept of the Whitehall model and, and, and the view that a lot of what we have in, in uh, passes for the Westminster model in, in parts of the former British uh, West Indies is really a, a Whitehall model, a cut-and-paste job among civil servants with political instructions in Whitehall uh, who crafted these constitutions and shipped them out to various parts of the former British Empire. But we also have to understand the extent to which senior officials in colonial governments at the time in the West Indies were very much involved in shaping these things. And what we have from the architect of the 1962 constitution in Trinidad and Tobago for independence is exactly where he got it from. Uh, it more or less confirms a lot of the, 
the, the, the Whitehall model version, but I merely share that with you to show how the draftsman drafted and where he got it from, and basically was a cut and paste job. Um, now the belief in the Whitehall model, um, again, now this is going into a, a conference, secret and confidential memorandum that Ellis Clark did for the colonial office. And uh, this explanatory memorandum was dated the 16th of April, 1962. Uh, so in writing, he had something to say about provisions for judges and so on. So this is, this is Ellis Clark now. Perhaps the most important single feature which goes to ensure the independence of the judiciary and the attraction to the judiciary of the right type of judge is the security of tenure afforded to judges. For that reason, no attempt has been made in the draft constitution to be original. And I repeat that, no attempt has been made to be original. A formula carefully devised by the colonial office after many years as being the most likely to be effective and acceptable, and yet not to derogate from the principles of independence has been adopted. It is word for word the formula that the colonial office was able to persuade Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Tanganyika to accept. There can be little doubt that it is what they would wish Trinidad and Tobago to accept. So what we have are the, the principal architects of our independence constitution telling us in no uncertain terms where they're getting everything from and what they're doing. The unsuspecting public does not know that a cut and paste job is being done. And this is the essence of what we're dealing with in a society very much rooted in British tradition. So I come now to uh, the first of the videos. And this is built into my speaking time, so. But it's important for me to make this point. <clears throat> Happiest island in all the Caribbean. Kingston was in holiday mood, and the whole population hung out the flags and metaphorically threw its hat in the air. They rejoiced, not that they were parting from Britain, they are firm adherents of the crown, but because Jamaica stood on the threshold of independence, and then it rained. A torrential <laughs> downpour, as inappropriate as our own deluge on bank holiday. But nature relented. And as though to be welcome, up came the sun as the airliner touched down at Palisados Airport, bringing to represent the Queen Princess Margaret. Independence was to have a royal greeting. There to welcome the princess and her husband was the governor, Sir Kenneth Blackburn, and the veteran prime minister, Sir Alexander Bustinati. <laughs> Greeting of Lady Blackburn, it was the turn of the Premier to bid Her Royal Highness a royal welcome. Then Princess Margaret was conducted to the saluting base to receive the royal salute by the Jamaica Regiment. <laughs> the 12 mile drive from the airport and through Kingston gave thousands the opportunity they had long awaited to express their own greeting in unmistakable manner. At the entrance to King's House, the princess spoke to some disabled children. Among them were girl guides and boy scouts. They are crippled, but they were not forgotten. The royal visitor had a word too with the woman in charge of them. <laughs> Next day, Her Royal Highness opened the great national stadium, which nobly expresses the pride and hope of the new nation. Sir Alexander Bustamante received the princess and Lord Snowden and conducted them to the royal box. This was the place where, at midnight on the following day, the flag of independent Jamaica would be raised. Princess Margaret said it was fitting that the country would serve as host for the ninth Central American and Caribbean Games. And after the applause came the emotional rendering of the Jamaican national anthem. taken by the young people. Jamaica's youth organizations had heard the princess say that the country's future rested with their generation. They made it look as if that future would be in good hands. One spectator who had been among the prime movers in achieving independence was the opposition leader Norman Manley. Two minutes to midnight, Sunday, August the 5th. 
the birth of Jamaican independence. The new flag was about to be hoisted over the stadium. Sir Kenneth Blackburn was soon to be a governor general, the higher rank in accord with the new status of Jamaica as full member of the Commonwealth. It is likely that before long he will be succeeded by a Jamaican, and who better than the 78-year-old Sir Alexander Bustamante. And uh, that more or less helps to make the point about being rooted in, in British traditions. And I have another one, which is the second one. This comes from Trinidad and Tobago. They both got independence in the same month in 1962. So we can look at the Trinidad and Tobago. The Royal Highness now hands over the constitutional instruments to the Prime Minister, who in turn replies. May it please your Royal Highness. It is with a feeling of deep pride, pleasure, and satisfaction as Prime Minister of the newly independent state of Trinidad and Tobago that I offer you for transmission to Her Majesty the Queen the profound thanks and appreciation of the government, parliament, and people of this country for Her Majesty's gracious message. We have looked forward with considerable pleasure to our entry into the Commonwealth family. Now that this goal has been achieved, I ask you to convey to Her Majesty an expression of our unfailing loyalty and devotion to her throne and person. We have been inspired by her good wishes, and we pledge ourselves to fulfill the promise expected of us, not only by Her Majesty, but by all the nations of the world, to show how our small community, with its people drawn from many lands of diverse racial origins, and subscribing to a variety of religious beliefs can, in harmonious cooperation, make its contribution to the sum total of world peace, world progress, and world happiness. May I conclude by expressing the hope that this visit of yours to our shores, which is not the first, will certainly not be the last, and that we shall have on some future occasion the opportunity to display once more the esteem and affection in which you are held by the people of Trinidad and Tobago and to demonstrate to you the contributions 
which we have set out to make to world democracy and to the defense and protection of human freedom. The leader of the opposition, Dr. Capildale, now speaks. May it please your royal highness to accept our sincerest thanks from this side of the house for the signal honor you have so graciously bestowed upon us by being present among us on this unforgettable occasion. It is fitting that at this historic moment, independence is heralded with the adornment and luster of British parliamentary democracy and that it is dedicated to the British parliamentary tradition. Every such dedication is a barrier which evil minds will have to surmount in order to advance into totalitarian paths. Nevertheless, we enter the future with high hopes and with unbounded confidence in ourselves, we and the other side of the house. The ceremony is ended. Parliament is inaugurated and independent Trinidad and Tobago has become the 15th member of the Commonwealth of Nations. What now? Right, well, those two videos uh, essentially capture uh, the essence of the extreme reverence uh, that in which uh, British royalty and all of the traditions conveyed through the constitutional instruments have been held. And when we look at them, we, we, we can understand many aspects of uh, that reverence. And Eric Williams is no stranger to extreme reverence for British traditions and, and, and British constitutional uh, technique. And you, I gave you his words earlier, and then you heard him in his own words. Um, obviously, in replying to uh, uh, Princess Alice in, in, in terms of the message that, that she brought from Her Majesty. But the occasion was one of high ceremony and obviously tremendous symbolism. Um, moving along now, uh, one of the things that we've seen about the Westminster model, obviously, is the extent to which you have um, tremendous excesses of executive power. And, and means of con con uh, curbing executive power obviously has been an issue that has arisen. And the Washington model has has provided some temptations um, in a number of areas uh, to, to try to curb Westminster-type um, um, excesses of executive power, uh, so that things like term limits for prime ministers and, and things like uh, fixed dates for elections. And so these are things that have formed part of our constitutional debate. And we've had a debate about these things, uh, other things like the right of recall, um, and, and so on. All of these things are issues that have been going on for some time. And of course, recent events in Trinidad and Tobago have brought a lot of this to the fore. But I'm just merely mentioning it to, to show why the, the Washington model does have some appeal, uh, because people are trying to deal with what they see as the excesses of executive power. Um, thanks. Uh, then I come to what perhaps is the most controversial aspect of the report by Major E.F.L. Wood who visited Parliamentary Under Secretary State for the Colonies, who visited the British West Indies in 1921-22. Major Wood, of course, was later to become Lord Halifax, um, the wartime Foreign Secretary. But this, for me, represents the most controversial statement in all of Major Wood's report. And, and, and what he says, as you can see there, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly long statement, but what he's trying to suggest in, in his statement um, is the whole history of the African population of the West Indies inevitably drives them towards representative institutions fashioned after the British model, transplanted by the slave trade and other circumstances to foreign soil, losing in the process their social system, language, and traditions, and with the exception of some relics of Obia, whatever religion they may have had, they owe everything that they have now and all that they are to the British race that first enslaved them and subsequently to its honor restore to them their freedom. Small wonder if they look for political growth to the only source and pattern that they know and aspire to share in what has been the peculiarly British gift of representative institutions. That for me is the most controversial um, political and sociological comment that Major Wood uh, made in his entire report. And um, I, I extrapolate that and link it back to what I'm talking about because the persistence of the Westminster model, we have to debate these things, but, but uh, the, the pages of history do, do tell us things from time to time. 
He also went on to make a comment about, uh, in, the, in the case of Trinidad, uh, about the Indian population. And his other quote in the report was, the East Indians are an important element in the community, and it would be a great misfortune if they were encouraged to stand aside from the main current of political life instead of sharing in it and assisting to guide its course. So that's another narrative, because there was um, a movement for Indian separation that was running concurrent with a lot of other um, issues at the time. So Major Wood was addressing that as well. So that is, that is also an issue that we need uh, to, to process in terms, in, particularly in the context of Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana, where perhaps that particular comment has more relevance. Now, trying to assess Major Wood's theory, um, essentially he, he was arguing a, a case that the African population did not have identity and, and would accept the foundations of British institutions as part of the evolution of Caribbean societies. Uh, and then he felt that the presence of an Indian identity was a threat to the stability of the society if they chose to pursue the agenda of separation. Um, as was done by the East Indian National Congress. So we're dealing with two things going on here, but they're important narratives in terms of understanding the evolution of these uh, institutions. And then I come to Williams's contradiction, because I, I, I showed you earlier um, his, his particular statement, uh, but then there is this contradiction we come up against, which is when you read Capitalism and Slavery, you would hardly think that Eric Williams would, would write and say some of the things that um, I showed you earlier and some of the things that you heard him say. But the reality is that there is a contradiction. Williams does have a contradiction between what he says in Capitalism and Slavery about British trusteeship in the British West Indies and what he then says about the, constitu the, the British constitution should be modified being ideal for Trinidad and Tobago because if it's good enough for Great Britain, it's good enough for Trinidad and Tobago. So we have to assess Williams's contradiction. Then there is Manley's assessment. And now 40 years ago this year, uh, Michael Manley, uh, in his book, The Politics of Change, um, had this to say at page 29. Uh, to the Jamaicans' historical distrust of authority must be added the fact that all the institutions through which the newly freed slave and indeed the entire society began to attain social coherence were designed in the shadow of the Westminster model of democracy. And perhaps Manley chose his words carefully in the shadow of, of Westminster model democracy. But we have to understand because uh, 40 years ago, Michael Manley, obviously uh, just at the start of of, of a whole uh, movement of democratic socialism and, and a time in government, uh, but in terms of his own writings, uh, writing that in The Politics of Change raises the issue of that whole system of government being designed in the post-slavery era in the shadow of the Westminster model of democracy. And then I'm coming down towards the end now, I, uh, another example of, a of, a, of, of the, the deep roots of British tradition uh, in our region has to do with the uh, Caribbean Court of Justice and their own contradictions. Um, you have a situation where the judges of the Caribbean Court of Justice, Sir Dennis Byron and before him Michael de Labastide, all telling us that we need to embrace the CCJ to complete the cycle of our independence. And that has been the mantra, not just from the, the politicians, but also the judges as activists going out and lobbying uh, around the region. And the, the argument being advanced is that uh, it's an anti-colonial premise, it's an anti-colonial narrative. But go on the website, go on the website of the Caribbean Court of Justice, and this is what you'll see. Mr. Justice de Labastide demitted office as Chief Justice on the 18th of July, 2002. He was sworn in as a member of the Privy Council by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on 27 July, 2004, and as President of the Caribbean Court of Justice on the 18th of August, 2004. So they started a convention that the President of the Caribbean Court of Justice shall become a member of Her Majesty's Privy Council, and they're running a concurrent narrative that we must complete the cycle of our independence by giving up the Privy Council, but a convention is established of becoming the President of the Caribbean, uh, the, a member of Her Majesty's Privy Council when you become President of the Caribbean Court of Justice. And then we see that the CCJ website also says the following about Sir Dennis Byron. In 2000, Mr. Justice Byron was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II and was appointed a member of the Privy Council in 2004. So what are we talking about? What are we talking about when we are dealing with the issue of constitutional reform in the region and all of these indigenous institutions, but we're setting up concurrently conventions that undermine the very narrative that is being used to encourage people out there to buy into the idea. And that is something that we have to be extremely careful about and to examine it closely because we are still a region steeped very much in British traditions. So, to close now, my, my final point here, the CCJ has to answer the question, 
of why it's necessary for the President and Chief Justice to be made a member of Her Majesty's Privy Council upon becoming the President and Chief Justice of the Court. Uh, you know, and that, that has been raised before. There's a stony silence from the CCJ on the subject, They're not answering the subject. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that the knighthood is indeed the gold standard of West Indian accomplishment in public affairs. Whether we like it or not, the knighthood is the gold standard of, of, of accomplishment in West Indian public affairs. And, and its desirability is widespread, and the prestige that it conveys comes from the very source that is criticized, Britain. So you criticize everything to do with colonialism, etc., but you readily accept all of the accolades and everything that goes and comes from that to the extent where we have countries in the region that have actually adapted the knighthood into their own system of national awards. So when you have cricketers who get knighthoods and so on, and you have this being perpetuated, you understand the extent to which British traditions are indeed deeply rooted. And that can explain to a large extent the question of why there is this persistence of the Westminster model. So we end with the question of what are we trying to reform? What William says is an import, or what Norman Manley says is definitely part of our heritage. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
that's another, that's another story. I, I wanted to kind of quickly comment on your interpretation of Eric Williams' intervention in 1955, because I think I actually read that intervention exactly the opposite way. When Williams is saying that our constitution, the British constitution, would be good enough for us, what he's doing is he's saying to the British governor and to the people who are saying that the West Indies cannot advance towards full, uh, full dominion status without having a proper constitution, that, guys, Britain doesn't have a written constitution. The British constitution is an un unwritten document. It has to do with uh, democratic government and a system of law. And that actually what he's making is a very kind of typically dry Williams uh, uh, intervention against the British. It's not, it's not at all in the vein which you're interpreting it. So that's, that's my reading. Well, I have a, a different view on it, and that is that um, it is precisely that because he, he talked about it being suitably modified. So he, he, he knew very well that it, it was unwritten. And in 1971, when he won all of the seats in the House of Representatives in a no-vote election campaign, proceeded to uh, embark on a constitution reform exercise by appointing um, a constitution commission under the chairmanship of Sir Hugh Wooding. He had started the process in the parliament before with a joint select committee. I mean, having won all of the seats in the general election, he had to find an alternative means, and a, and a, and a constitution commission under the chairmanship of Sir Hugh Wooding was appointed, who reported in January of 1974. In December of 1974, he completely thrashed the report um, because they were, represent, they were recommending some very anti-Westminster um, things and proceeded to engage in a constitution reform exercise that gave us back West Westminster without the Governor General. So that Williams, and, and, and refused to engage on removing the Privy Council and he kept it and, and there is hands out to confirm the reasons why. So that um, Williams was very, very much the quintessential colonial um, who uh, would not let go of, of anything. And part of the reason was if you're forming a political movement with a constitution like that and you're going to dominate the process in a place um, where you, you had, and there's a lot of colonial office documentation to, to demonstrate the extent to which the colonial office clearly favored Williams in terms of handing over an independent state to a political party. Uh, Williams knew that the colonial office was with him on, on, on the issue. And it could have been that he was trying to play with the colonial office by, by being able to uh, support a particular line of thought that um, put the British constitution in a suitably modified form up as the ideal that we should all um, yearn for. The reality is that he never deviated from it. And when that Wooding Commission, my colleague Selvin Ryan is here, he was on that commission. When that Wooding Commission <laughs> went against what Williams wanted, they got the tongue lashing of their lives for eight and a half hours over two days in, in the House of Representatives, the 13th and the 17th of December, 1974. And as a young A-level student, I sat through all eight and a half hours and absorbed every minute of it. So I, I know exactly what I'm speaking about. And, and, and Williams was determined that he was not going to deviate from Westminster. Uh, he, had a, he had very good rhetoric, he had excellent political communication skills, but his core philosophy was to keep the Westminster model. And, and that is something that exists even to today. I'm sure you're absolutely right about that at the same time as, as I think for that 1955 intervention is not actually a document you can use as part of that kind of line of, of evidence. But one other point, Sierra Leone. Uh, the appearance of Sierra Leone in that, in that document which you, which you saw. So it has to do with the connection with Morris Dorman. And Morris Dorman was governor of Trinidad and Tobago before he became governor of Sierra Leone and had very close links with Ellis Clark through the Masonic lodges. So um, uh, we're looking at, uh, the Sierra Leone is there for a reason because of a particular Trinidad-Sierra Leone connection which exists in the late 50s, early 60s. Just it also confirmed the cut and paste job that was done. <laughs> <laughs> Next questioner, please. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, Horius Matthews from the Marcus Garvey People's Political Party. Listening to your presentation, it leads me to think that having accepted the Westminster model and the economic system that went ahead with it, both are not working. All of these great scholars became a part of the Bretton Woods system, the type that we are, we are being governed under. Why is it we could not have had an independent economic model other than accepting the Bretton Woods model, which is still not working for us up to today? Economics is not my forte. <laughs> I, 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 
I mean, I, I really can't give you an enlightened answer to that, to that question. I think the, the person who was here before uh, would have been better uh, equipped to, to answer that. And I, I certainly don't go trespassing into areas of academia that are not my, my, my core area of expertise. So I would respectfully decline to answer that. Just one, one, one point of fact to begin with. The Bretton Woods system ends in 1971. Uh, it collapses when the dollar breaks its convertibility to gold. It's, it's a system that runs from 1944 through to 1971. Um, what, I mean, what, what, however, what I would, however, say to you is that um, what it is quite clear that if one looks at the structure of British decolonization uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, its principal priority was to preserve the rule of property and to ensure that the succession to independent regimes would preserve institutions and preserve British and Western economic interests. And there's one article which I recommend everyone read, uh, which was published in the 1990s by uh, two uh, great uh, fathers of my particular academic tribe, two imperial historians, uh, Ronald Robinson and uh, William Roger Lewis. And the article is called The Imperialism of Decolonization. Uh, and it's um, an article published in the 1990s which looks at the ways in which British uh, policymakers in the mid and late 1950s said, okay, uh, under the pressure of the Americans, decolonization is coming. Let us at least attempt to control uh, the kinds of outcomes that come from this process. Uh, and what we can see around the world uh, um, is the deliberate patronage of particular kinds of political leaders uh, who were viewed to be cooperative. Uh, and these people were told in no uncertain terms that the terms on which you will acquire independence will be the preservation of uh, this particular social and economic order. Uh, so that the nature of decolonization has, was in almost almost all cases, one which did not go along with any kind of disruption uh, of the structure of property uh, or the nature of social relations on any significant scale. Uh, at least it wasn't quite as bad as in the French case, which is what they, when, where they went about essentially um, killing uh, the politicians who were more dangerous. So, you know, the, very, the late 50s, early 60s, there are a number of very dangerous people in the French colonies who die of radioactive poisoning. Franz Fanon dies of leukemia at the age of 35. Um, there are all these, uh, uh, Felix Mumier is poisoned by thallium. Uh, Ruben Umniobe is, uh, ends up being killed. Of course, the famous case of Lumumba. Uh, Mehdi Ben Barker is kidnapped and dissolved in a vat of acid. Uh, all the dangerous poss possible leaders are eliminated. Uh, and the, those who are cooperative are encouraged and are lent uh, support. And the result is a post-colonial order which is in remarkable continuity in social and economic and cultural terms with the regime which existed before. Thank you. We'll take this as a, the last question. Yes, please. Yeah. I don't know if my question would be relevant now that Dr. Philip isn't here, while Mr. Golden still here, maybe it might be relevant then. Well, <laughs> that don't say you can't answer my question, right? Yes, my question is, what about extrajudicial judicial killings that have been going on for the longest while in Jamaica? Is it normal to the Westminster model of government <laughs> that was intended for, uh, what's the word I want to find here? For, 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 a, for a joke anyway, right? Why both parties, when in government, seem so silent about judicial killings, or extra ju 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 judicial killings? And I am known on radio for defending the death penalty. Thank you. Um, this is probably a question that uh, others could better address, but uh, if you wish to to take this on, either of you? <laughs> well, there's, the, the, there's a problem with extrajudicial killing uh, in Jamaica, in Trinidad, in Guyana. There's a problem with police torture throughout the Caribbean, um, uh, you know, where people who are essentially beaten into submission until they sign confessions. Um, uh, that is, uh, is, I think, um, I, I'm not sure whether one correlates that with the Westminster system or with uh, simply the, the origins of our society in, uh, in a great deal of collective violence. And uh, I mean, I think that the killings are new. Uh, they are part of the post-independence experience. Um, the torture is old. Um, that's how the police, police forces worked for a long time. Uh, and um, 
I think it's a problem we have to confront. But whether, it's, it's, whether, it's, whether it follows clearly from Westminster democracy is another question. Well, thank you to all the speakers and for your questions. And before we thank the speakers, um, we break now for lunch. And I think we can catch up some time if we reconvene at 1 p.m., as stated in the program, uh, for our next panel on Westminster in practice. Uh, so thanks once again for your enlightening presentation. <laughs>